So again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is the final webinar in our series with Dr. Alan Power, Schlegel Chair in Aging and Dementia Innovation, who's been sharing ways long-term care homes can apply their culture change journey to caring for those living with dementia. I hope you'll stay with us to the end of the webinar. We have a survey for you to fill out about your webinar experience, and you'll have the opportunity to tell us what you'd like to learn about in future webinars. My name is Holly Hebner. I am a project coordinator with the Ontario Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care, hosted at the Research Institute for Aging, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. This webinar is brought to you by the Ontario CLRI program that strengthens quality of life and care for residents across the province. We do this by providing education and training, sharing research and innovations, and identifying and developing resources for long-term care homes. The program partners with the long-term care sector and aims to provide solutions for priority issues, including an aging population, increasing care complexity, and workforce excellence. We are funded by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Long-Term Care and are hosted at three different sites, Baycrest Health Sciences, Briere, and the Schlegel UW Research Institute for Aging. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples whose land we are fortunate to be on. And we are so glad to have Dr. Power here with us again this afternoon, and I'll turn it over to him now. Thank you very much, Holly, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to have you back online for this. Um, boy, it's a beautiful sunny day in Rochester. I hope you've got that in Canada as well. You just got a little break in the weather. It's quite pleasant. Um, I'm going to uh, give some guidelines around the idea of balancing autonomy and risk. I love this uh, photo that I borrowed from my friend, Dr. Emmy Kyoto, of a woman who wants to do something at the sink and she's a little too short, so she just grabbed a stool and climbed up on top. Um, and uh, it just kind of speaks to, I think, what we we're talking about today. Um, what I'd like to do is just give some thoughts around uh, the idea of um, enabling choice versus risk particularly in people living with a diagnosis of dementia. Um, not that I have any hard and fast rules, but I want to give you some guidelines and some things to think about. And I thought we would start with a uh, story, a true story that came from Schlegel Villages uh, several years ago. And uh, I'll begin by sharing that with you, at least the first half. We'll get to the, the latter half of the story uh, later in the talk. And um, we have a couple poll questions that will go with this one as well. This uh, was told to me by Heather Luth, who's the Dementia Program Coordinator at Schlegel Villages. Uh, she used to work at the village of Wentworth Heights in Hamilton. And uh, I was visiting her once there a few years ago. And uh, on the way in the door where you have to punch a key code to get in the door, uh, she saw a gentleman standing inside. So she told me not to punch the key code that he liked to help people come in. So I, I waited and the gentleman um, punched the code for us and we thanked him. and. And then later, uh, Heather told me his story. I'm calling him Frank. Um, Frank uh, was uh, 90 years old and um, was a Polish-Canadian citizen, a World War II veteran, had actually been captured uh, by the Germans in the war when he was spying for the Allies and was in a POW camp until he was liberated uh, at the end of the war. He uh, was widowed and had a son who... Um, didn't get over to support him a lot. And because of some dementia, he was having more and more trouble managing by himself. And it was felt by all that an assisted living type of uh, arrangement would be better for him. So he moved into the village of Wentworth Heights and he was able to walk freely within the indoor area. But when he tried to use the outside door, there was a key code and he was unable to uh, exit the building. He immediately became very distressed and upset about the fact that he couldn't go outside. He was uh, yelling loudly, he was you know, banging on doors. He was um, really uh, quite angry and upset and was upsetting other people's result. And this happened right from uh, early on when he moved in. And uh, so after a few days of this, the team was very concerned about this. They were concerned, uh, gee, why is he so upset? Does he need some kind of medication? So Heather decided to uh, talk to Frank and find out what his story was and what he was trying to accomplish. And uh, Frank told her his story and mentioned his uh, work in the war and his being captured and everything, and uh, told her uh, about his uh, later adult life and then said, and now here I am, I'm 90 years old and I'm a prisoner once again. 
And Heather said, well, what would you do if you could uh, go out that door? And he said, well, I'd like to sit on that bench out there in the sunshine and feed the birds and watch the people go by. And so Heather went back to the team and said, do you think we could teach Frank the door code? Well, there was some skepticism. Number one, people worried about the safety of doing that. Number two, there was some skepticism as to whether he could even learn the door code. Uh, but they decided to give it a try. And it took a bit of repetition, took a couple of weeks for him to really get it down. But he did, and he was able to use the door code and go outside and sit and feed the birds. And he was calm, no longer upset, no longer calling out loud or anything, and uh, quite happy doing this uh, as he wished. And things went on that way for quite some time. But um, he began talking about wanting to visit his house to make sure it was okay, and also going to a cafe in town where he used to hang out with a couple of his old buddies and uh, have a have a drink or a sandwich and you know, tell stories. And um, because they were busy, the staff would tend to put him off, and they would say, oh, maybe when your son uh, comes next time, he can take you out. Um, but nothing really happened along those lines. So... Uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, if you are a senior citizen, you can uh, take the buses for free. And uh, there's a bus loop in front of uh, the village. And one day, Frank was sitting out there, and the bus pulled up, and he jumped on the bus and disappeared. Um, when it was determined that he had jumped on the bus and disappeared, uh, the staff talked about it, and they, they said they knew what he'd been asking for. They had an idea where he went, and they drove to the cafe that he used to go to, and there he was sitting with a friend, and he uh, greeted the team member warmly and was very happy to return to the village of Wentworth Heights um, and uh, was fine the rest of the day. So um, a couple of poll questions, and we'd like you to uh, take a look at these. The first question is, uh, if you were a team member in charge of this situation, what would you do now? And I've given you four choices. Number one, change the door code, remove Frank's privileges. Number two, only allow supervised trips outside. Number three, continue the plan as before. Or number four, something else. So if you'd like to check one of those boxes, one, two, three, four, um, we'll just do a quick poll and see where people are sitting right now with this situation. And I'm not saying there's a right answer. There's no right answer. Um, it's really about how people feel about this whole situation. So our result is. Um, the, actually, the largest number said something else, almost half the people. Uh, some said continue the plan as before, about a third. Some, uh, only only a small number would actually say you can't go outside, but a certain number said they would probably about a sixth said, well, we should have supervised trips. Um, because there were so many people that said something else, um, maybe we could just visit the chat box for a second. Are there some other ideas that we didn't put down that somebody would like to put in there that... that they had in mind, or were you just thinking, I don't know, but it's not these three. Anybody got any ideas you'd like to type up quickly before we go on? I'm watching the uh, questions box and nothing's coming in just yet. Make um, sure that you type it and then down below where it says two. Here, the, yeah, here we go. They're coming in. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. All right. Let's see here. Um, someone said plan ahead for outings. Okay, great. So um, looking at the instead of just looking at the idea of going outside, looking at what drove him to leave. That's a great thought. Um, someone said ask his friend from the cafe to visit at the village. Okay, great. So move the uh, social uh, engagement to a different place. That's a great idea too. Um, someone said I'd explore if he could use public transportation on his own on a regular basis. Okay. Oh, goodness, they're coming so quickly, it's disappearing. <laughs> uh, I've done, and they said they've done this with residents in long-term care before, and it can be very successful. Okay. Uh, let the people at the cafe know about uh, Frank and uh, the bus system as well. Yeah. And which I don't think, it, that, I think that's a great, just to have open communication and honesty with the, with the organizations that are, you know, now becoming involved so that everyone can have a cohesive plan. Yeah, and you know, that's one of the fundamentals of a, of a dementia-friendly or a dementia-inclusive community is giving education to whether it be bus drivers or cafe owners so they understand dementia, so they understand how to support people who they may interact with during the day. So I think yeah. those are great. My guess is that um, maybe the best plan, I'll tell you what, what, uh, Hamil what uh, Wentworth Heights did, but maybe the best plan is some combination of all the things people mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
location, the combination of being sure he's okay with transportation, the combination of, of um, maybe visits out with visits in. Um, so lots of great ideas there. So I'm glad we asked because um, I don't usually see such a big, um, such a big result for number four. So I, I was very curious about that. Now I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. I just want, I'm curious to see if these numbers change. Uh, I'm giving you the same choices. The next question is, uh, besides what you would do, what do you think your leadership would do if Frank lived in your community? It might be the same or it might be a little different. So I'm just curious as to how much the numbers change. Okay, now we see that a lot more people feel that the organization would default to changing the door code. 1% 1, one to 26%. Supervised trips went from 16% to 42 So the first two options, which are what we would call more restrictive options, went from a total of 17% to a total of 68%, nearly 70%. So you can see that I think a lot of people feel, and I think that's often the case, that maybe the organization uh, when you get the leadership, when you get the lawyers involved and everybody else is going to default to something a bit more restrictive than what we might feel uh, is uh, is okay. Continuing the plan went down to about half of what it was before, 36 to 18, and something else dropped quite a bit too. Okay, thanks for doing that. That was uh, very instructive for me. So I will come back to that and I'll let you know what, what uh, the folks uh, did uh, at Wentworth Heights. But in the meantime, um, I just want to give you some background here and try and get things to. There we go. I'm going to give you some quotes throughout this talk. The first one is from this wonderful book by uh, Ruth Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor called Broadening the Dementia Debate Towards Social Citizenship. And they wrote, oppressive and discriminatory practices often have their foothold in the well-meaning, well-intentioned ideas of those least intending to do harm. In other words, we don't restrict people because we're naturally mean, but because we care about them and that caring sometimes leads to being very concerned about people's safety. Another quote and one of my favorites from my colleague uh, Daniela Greenwood, a consultant in Australia, is that much of what we call person-centered care is actually bossing people around in a very individualized way. Um, so I think that um, sometimes we will use that terminology because it's a great buzzword but what we're doing is we're learning about people so that we can decide what's the best way to support them without really necessarily taking much more of their input uh, into actually making those decisions. So that's a, just a caution as we move forward in this world of culture change. A quick reminder of what I talked about last time, my overall approach to dementia rests on three pillars. The first was broadening the definition of dementia, not just as biomedical brain disease, but looking as, it, as, as a person's shifting experience and perception of the world around them. Uh, so that we start to take that into account and start to look through more of a disability lens and decide how we can accommodate the living environment to help support the person with changing abilities changing uh, perceptions. The second was to not just try to mitigate disease, but to um, set a primary goal of trying to improve several global aspects of well-being for people. And the third is the culture change part, transforming the living and care environment wherever people live, so that those first two uh, aspects of the approach will um, really take hold. And um, that can be environmental transformation, but it could also be operations, how things, how things operate, how things are communicated, how decisions are made, how we support people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I took those seven domains of well-being that I use, that I borrowed from the Eden Alternative, and I put them in a bit of a pyramid. And I don't do this to suggest a hierarchy, but rather to say that if you want to help restore these domains of well-being to people, I feel it's great to start with identity and connectedness. Um, and uh, because it's it's hard to bring well-being to a stranger and if you know the person and have a meaningful relationship it's a little bit easier to find those solutions and to work with the person um so um the, the main reason i'm showing the pyramid now is just to show you the way it's set up what the uh what it looks like when you look at autonomy and where it sits on this pyramid as you can see it's sitting on top of identity and connectedness it's sitting beside security and it's sitting underneath meaning growth and eventually joy and kind of supporting the top part of the pyramid. 
And um, I think that, that just that graphic is kind of instructive for this talk when you think about it, because these are points of physical contact on the pyramid, but they're also potential points of conflict uh, when it comes to enhancing autonomy for people. So for example, if you don't have a good sense of identity or connectedness, which is the foundation on this pyramid, then autonomy may be depleted. Autonomy and security have a very interesting dynamic in which they can support each other or an overemphasis on security can actually reduce autonomy. And then autonomy in itself also supports meaning and growth. And if you don't have autonomy, it's very hard to engage meaningfully or grow as a person. So I want to uh, just sort of look at those different dynamics uh, in this talk. And uh, I'm mainly gonna spend my time in that middle section with autonomy and security. But I just wanna say a few words uh, on the other ones as well. So to begin with, uh, with identity and connectedness, how can well-meaning people erode autonomy by not having a good enough sense of identity or connectedness about the person, not creating enough of a relationship or enough knowledge, deep knowing of the person? And I think there are several ways. First of all, if people inhabit the stigmas and the low expectations based on the myths and stereotypes of people with dementia, then they're less likely to uh, enhance autonomy. If people exclude people with dementia from discussions or decision-making, obviously that's going to erode autonomy. If uh, communication is not carefully done, if care practices uh, tend to not um, follow people's needs or preferences, then that will erode autonomy. Um, and that also goes over into care systems and staffing patterns. So for example, if you are constantly uh, rotating care team members, uh, then people that come in to care for the person aren't gonna know the person very well, and they are less likely to take a chance that the person can decide something or do something for themselves. So it's much less likely that the person will have uh, any ability to choose. Um, and I think a lot of the um, a lot of the ways we look at medicalized views of dementia are staging systems that show a progressive decline, our assessments, which are all about what's wrong with you, our categorizations, especially the whole BPSD, uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which I went through in great detail on the last talk. These are all things that will take away people's ability to choose. And lastly, if people live in a segregated living environment, um, they may lose the ability to choose too. And just for a moment, I wanna just uh, focus on that last bullet for just a second. Many of you have heard of me uh, speaking about unlocking doors, about um, uh, integrating people with dementia with people without dementia. And obviously to do those things, we have to talk about some of the things that are in this webinar today, because uh, bringing people out of locked doors or putting people uh, in areas that are more general living areas does entail a certain amount of risk in order to increase that freedom. And so these are some of the things we have to talk about. But when we do separate people, particularly in those secured units, um, we do cause a lot of um, lack of choice in the people who live there. First of all, the door is locked, so they cannot come and go freely. That's a big erosion of autonomy right there. There's lack of choice in determining where to live. Now, I've traveled around the world, and um, I suppose there may be a few people out there of the, of the thousands or millions that live in in uh, dementia-specific living areas, but my, but I have yet to meet a single person who toured various living options and decided for herself or himself that they wanted to live in that dementia-specific place behind a locked door. It's almost always decided by family members and or the operators as the best place for a person. So there's no choice in deciding to go there in the first place. Um, I think that when we see people with all these different forms of dementia, different levels of ability, different personalities as one homogenous group and say, this is dementia care, then that leads to a lack of individualization. And once again, enabled, enabling choice requires really individualized approaches, individualized care plans, as we'll talk about. You have to be able to do that if you want to enable choice. Um, Stephen Sabat said in his book uh, about dementia that he wrote back in 2001, um, like through a tangled veil, um, that people being around people without dementia also have the ability to engage with what he called more able social persona. In other words, when, you, when you're around people who are more capable, it actually helps you to do more and do better. And lastly, if people are living in a place where those around them have those stigmas and have those low expectations of them because they are people with dementia, then that will lead to various self-fulfilling prophecies where people cannot do as much because we don't give them the opportunity to do so.
So we're not going to solve that problem today. That could be another webinar, but I just wanted to throw those uh, ideas out there. Let's talk about that fragile dynamic of security or autonomy. Um, there are two common practices we see in different um, retirement and aged care uh, and long-term care environments, and even in the home, that tend to erode people's ability to choose. One of them I'll call all or none thinking, and the second one is surplus safety. So what do those mean? Well, all or none thinking is simply that. We don't see shades of gray. We don't see nuances. We only see black or white. He can decide or he can't. She can do that or she can't. Um, so that stems from a lot of things. First of all, the stigmas of dementia, our tendency to view people in black and white and not be able to see those gradations of ability. Often our misunderstanding of our role as carers, that we think our job is to take over and decide for people, that that's the best way to care for people. It's also a misunderstanding of empowerment. And I might say that this is not just about people with dementia, it's about other elders who are living without dementia. And it's very much about how we treat uh, the team members who report to us too. Sometimes we think empowerment is just saying, go do it without any kind of guidelines or, or rules or regulations or, or discussion or practice. And, and then when things go wrong, you say, well, empowerment doesn't work. But, but we know that empowerment actually has many different characteristics. Uh, for example, when you are teaching a teenager to drive, you just don't hand that child the keys and say, okay, you're empowered. You have to take your life in your hands, get in the car with them, teach them what to do. It's very much a hands-on experience. And also remember that there are parameters, there are rules of the road. So people think empowerment and limitations don't go hand in hand, but there's always parameters or limitations to any empowerment. If you have a driver's license, you can drive anywhere you want in Canada, but if the light turns red, you still have to stop. And that's how you keep empowerment from becoming too dangerous or chaotic. And one of the biggest barriers, maybe the biggest barrier to choice is inflexible care systems because inflexible care systems do not uh, organize themselves around your individual pace, your individual ability, your individual needs or preferences. And as a result, um, you are shut down as far as wanting to live life with the rhythms and the style that is normal for you. Surplus safety is a concept that, that I first heard developed mainly by uh, Drs. Bill Thomas and Dr. Judah Ranch. And the idea is that there's too much concern with downside risk compared to upside risk. So what do I mean by that? Well, risk in itself, the word risk doesn't have to be good or bad. Risk can be defined as what are the chances that something will happen that's different than what you expected. So we know what downside risk is. And that is, you know, if Holly gets up and walks on her own, what are the chances she'll fall and break her hip? Or if uh, Tammy goes for a walk outdoors on her own, what are the chances she'll get lost or maybe step into traffic? Now, those are real risks and we have to talk about them. But what we don't talk about very often is upside risk. What's the chance that something will turn out better than expected? So if Holly gets up and walks, maybe her gait and balance will improve and she'll be more independent. Or if Tammy goes outside, maybe she will get some sunshine, she'll get some exercise, her mood will be better, she'll be relaxed, she'll sleep better at night. So we can't look at one side without the other. Things can get worse, things can get better. But with dementia and with most uh, formal living environments, whether they be retirement or, or uh, long-term care, the focus is almost always on the downside. So there's a real imbalance there between looking at what could go wrong versus what could go right. Here's a quote from Atul Gawande, who wrote the wonderful book, Being Mortal, which I think is quite interesting. He said, we want autonomy for ourselves and safety for those we love. That remains the main problem and paradox for the frail. Many of the things we would want for those we care about are things we would adamantly oppose for ourselves because they would infringe upon our sense of self. So a lot of people who talk about this, I use the phrase, the dignity of risk. Um, do we give people the dignity to be able to take risks in order to have a more full life or a better quality of life? I'll also tell a couple stories here just to mention that surplus safety can also take away our critical thinking skills. So um, here's a couple stories. One of them comes from my friend Karen Stobie, who you may have met in your travels. She and her husband, Mundy Carter, uh, use their improv theater training to help teach uh, better engagement for people living with dementia. 
And Karen's mother lived with Alzheimer's for many years, and she cared for her for about a decade at home. But then the time came when she had to move to an assisted living community. And the two of them toured together and looked at different places. And they were walking through one very lovely place. And they walked by a door that led out to a courtyard. And the courtyard had raised gardens. It had a paved path. It had a fence around it. It had benches. It was a beautiful sunny day. It just looked like the perfect outdoor space for people that wanted to get a little fresh air. So Karen uh, kind of automatically went over and pushed on the door, and the door didn't open. And um, the woman giving the tour said, oh, yeah, we have to keep that door locked. And Karen said, well, why? It's, it's such a beautiful environment out there. It looks perfectly safe. And the woman said, well, we used to have people go out there, but somebody fell once and got hurt. And Karen, um, bright as she is, looked at the woman and she said, tell me, has anyone ever fallen inside and gotten hurt before? In other words, do we say, okay, someone fell and broke their hip so no one can be indoors anymore? So this is the kind of over, over uh, conservative thinking that leads us to restrict everybody instead of to understand how individuals may or may not be at risk. Uh, the other picture there of Tiger Woods is just a reminder that, that when golfers play golf, um, you know, they often, when they're hitting a shot to approach the green, they will test the wind because uh, if the wind is blowing a little bit from one side to the other, they may aim the ball into the wind slightly, expecting it to blow the ball back on course, and that gets them closer to the hole. Um, but it occurs to me that when we look at most of the policies and procedures that we see in elder care, most of them were as if uh, maybe Tiger said to himself, you know, back in 2013, a wind came out of the west at 50 miles an hour, and so I should always aim the ball way over to the west every time I hit it, just in case it happens again. That's kind of how we plan our policies and procedures. We take that one horrible thing that might happen, and we punish everybody uh, so that it won't happen again. But think of how successful a Woods would be as a golfer, if that's the way you always hit the ball. And think of how successful we are in long-term care when we set up our policies and procedures that way. So I want to share one more remarkable quote from my colleague, Dr. Bill Thomas, and that is, the only risk-free human environment is a coffin. There is no risk-free environment. Every time you get in a car, take a bus to work, uh, you're taking a risk. Every time you raise your hand and ask a question, you're taking a risk or share your opinion. Uh, there's so many things we do. We don't even have to get to things like bungee jumping to talk about risk. But um, but the point is that we do these things because we think that a little risk is, is worth it to gain whatever we gain from going or doing whatever we're doing. We always have to balance risk with reward. Uh, we can't just say that you can eliminate risk because it's impossible. The only time you have no more risk is when you're dead. So how do we support autonomy for people who are living with a diagnosis of dementia? Well, some of the ways to do it are to optimize our communication and facilitation skills. I'll come back to that. To consider not just black or white, but a spectrum of ability. To look at upside as well as downside. And instead of trying to eliminate risk, what we need to do is to negotiate risk. So improving our communication, our interpersonal skills. Um, I remind people that before we talk about Frank taking the bus or whether your mom or dad can still drive a car, the most fundamental basic level of empowerment comes in good communication skills. Because when you take the time to communicate and facilitate well with a person living with dementia, you are actually empowering them to understand you and to be understood and to make their needs known. If we don't use those skills, then we're actually shutting down people's empowerment. So the first thing we need to do is really sharpen our skills. Understand what people's communication barriers are so that we can work around them, whether it's changing the pace of what we say, whether it's understanding word finding difficulties, whether it's um, understanding uh, how to ask a question so people understand it better. Understand that many people who cannot find the facts anymore will shift to expressions that are based on symbolism or emotions. So they may speak to their feelings rather than the actual facts. And if we get stuck on the facts of I want to go home, we may miss the deeper feeling or the symbolism that's actually being expressed. And then understand the people that don't use words, at least in any understandable way, are often expressing themselves through body language what uh, Kantos and Nagli called embodiment or embodiment or embodied expressions. So people's gestures can be seen as behaviors, but they can also be seen as ways of expressing choice or ways of expressing uh, what you'd like. Um, learning how to work together through tasks, doing with rather than doing for or doing to, and getting frequent consent and input, even when people can't seem to do a lot 
during a task. Um, we could talk a lot more some other time about communication skills, but these are just some general principles. Um, in my second book, Dementia Beyond Disease, I, I wrote a seven-step pathway to negotiating risk that I thought might be worth considering for people that want to do something that you might be concerned about. Uh, so I'll just go through these quickly. Um, the first one is to discuss with a person what it is they want to do, like Heather sat down with Frank, talked about what he wanted to do and asked him why he wanted to do it and what it would mean to him, and she got his story and got his perspective. The second one is exploring values too and tying it into people's well-being needs. It meant a lot for Frank to have that freedom. It meant a lot for him to be outdoors in the fresh air, but also um, understanding how people tolerate risk. You know, when you go to a financial planner to invest your money, the first thing that they always ask you is, what is your risk tolerance? Do you want to invest in really uh, speculative things like junk bonds? Or would you rather have your money in a safer vehicle because you're not that kind of a person? Or you might make a little bit less over time, but you're not gonna lose it all in a big downturn uh, because people are different and we all see risk differently. There are conditions of empowerment, as I mentioned, and there's also a continuum of empowerments, a continuum of empowerment. And you suggested some of those things. So rather than telling Frank he can't go out the door, can we educate the bus driver in the cafe? Can we have his friend come to him? Can we have his son take him there? What are some ways that we can help? Or if it comes to say a person driving, instead of just saying you can drive or you can't, I was with a gentleman in Australia last month and uh, he's living with uh, mild dementia. He still drives, but he has put restrictions on himself. He only drives in nice weather, only within his neighborhood, only during the daytime. So once again, you can, uh, you can put uh, different uh, conditions along the continuum to help make things as safe as possible. And then when all that's been discussed, to try to reach as collaborative a decision as possible, really trying as best you can to represent the person's wishes. Then after doing that, there are two more steps that are kind of beyond the decision, but they're very important. The first one is to document and monitor the results. Two reasons to do that. Number one, uh, you may not have planned it perfectly, and if things don't go right, it doesn't mean you can't do it anymore. It means maybe you go back to the drawing board and make a couple of other uh, adjustments to make sure it's as safe and successful as possible. And the other reason you do it is because people change over time. So what Frank is able to do now may change six months or a year from now. The plan may not work forever, so you may have to revisit. And the last one is to keep other stakeholders abreast of your discussion. Uh, that might be a family member, it might be other team members, people from other departments, it might be volunteers, it might actually be people from the ministry who are coming in as well. This is not done so that any of those people can veto your decision. What you and the resident decide should really be of paramount importance. But don't set yourself up for a fight. It's, it's you know, no one likes surprises. Uh, no one wants a family member to be coming in and seeing their loved one doing something that they had no idea they might be doing. So keep people in the loop. It's just good skills, good communication skills. And certainly as a doctor, I can tell you that what we're told over and over again is the most liability suits, the number one, uh, the number one reason for us for a lawsuit is not a bad outcome. It's lack of good communication and trust between the uh, the members. So communication is always a good thing. Um, before I finish the rest of the story, just once again to explain that di people, different different people view risk differently. You know, um, I was watching a Stephen Colbert segment uh, the other day where he went to New Zealand and he, after a couple of uh, shy attempts, he finally went bungee jumping, which uh, I give him a lot of credit for, I guess, um, but that's not something you're gonna see me doing. Um, so um, there are some other ways where I'm very happy to take a risk. I'm happy to go outside. Even if I've fallen down, I want to go outside. I do not want to live in a locked living area. So each of us has our own balance of what is risk and what is reward. <laughs> and there's no policy and procedure that can please everybody. You've got to come up with individualized plans as much as possible. And um, so to get to the rest of the story, what did uh, Wentworth Heights do? Well. They went with choice number three. They decided not, <coughs> excuse me, I got a little coughing and have some tea. They decided not to change the care plan. And here's why. This was their thinking. Um, number one, they did think that uh, Frank showed some very good executive function in that he knew what he wanted to do. He knew how to use the bus. He knew where to get off. He knew where he was going. He was where he said he would be. And he willingly came back when people came to pick him up. Um, there was no um, there was no place where that fell down. 
Uh, that's very different from a person who is all of a sudden lost and wandering the streets saying, help me, I don't know where I am. Those are two very different people and you have to look at the success of the plan very differently with those people. But they felt that Frank was pretty successful. Now I wanna jump forward to the day when I met Frank. He, uh, this story that Heather told me was four years old. And in those four years, Frank had jumped on the bus three times. And each time he went where he said he was going and came back when people went to get him. Now, um, I'm not saying that what they said was the right decision because these are very complicated. And this is just an example to get you thinking. There are two ways you can look at that four-year history. You could say, oh my God, that's three times when anything could have happened. He could have gotten lost. He could have gotten off the bus in the wrong place. He could have fallen. He could have stepped in front of a car and gotten killed. And that's absolutely true. Those were three times when that risk did exist. But you could also say that that was nearly 1,500 days, maybe 1,400 plus days, when he was calm, when he was happy, when he wasn't yelling, pounding on the doors, and possibly being medicated, uh, you know, with an antipsychotic or something because of his distress, not feeling trapped like a prisoner of war, not giving up on life. So that's to show that we are negotiating. We are not eliminating anything. But I think that those 1,400 days of good quality of life are equally uh, are, are more than more than enough balance for the three days of risk. Now going forward, uh, Frank's abilities did change. He was less able to do that, um, and his son still uh, doesn't come in that often. But what they've done is they found uh, a volunteer who has a Polish background, who uh, speaks Polish with Frank, uh, who's about his age, uh, a little bit younger, and they. Um, they put a, a regular date for a visit to the cafe on his calendar and the volunteer takes him. And that has satisfied Frank. He still goes outside, but he doesn't feel the need to get on the bus anymore because he knows he's going. So once again, over time, they made the adjustment in his plan. One last quick story about meaning and growth. I mentioned that autonomy supports meaning and growth, and that's another aspect. And um, so I'll tell you a story that, that really changed my thinking that came from my friend, Dr. Court Nygaard, who's a psychologist down in Tennessee. And um, he was asked to see a gentleman once, and this was a person in assisted living who did not have any significant dementia, but he had a severe arthritis, which made it hard for, for him to do things for himself. He used to lay floors for a living, and he couldn't do that anymore when his arthritis got severe. And he became disabled, but was living alone and was having trouble managing. So he moved into an assisted living place, but it was a place where pretty much, you know, the hospitality model, everybody's doing for you. And uh, they create this living environment and this lifestyle that doesn't really give you the opportunity to give back. And um, he was feeling kind of depressed because he didn't feel his life had any purpose. And so Court went to see him and he was exploring this guy's uh, feelings of uh, lack of meaning in his life. And Court, trying to be helpful, said, well, um, there must be something meaningful he could do here. I'll bet they could use some help folding clothes in the laundry. Do you think we could talk to him about that? And the guy said, no, I don't want to fold clothes. That's just busy work. I want something meaningful. So Court, being very smart and not just throwing things out there, said, well, you tell me, what would be a meaningful job for you to do? And the man thought about it for a second, and he said, I'd like a job to do where if I screw it up, something bad happens. Now, I know that makes people <laughs> laugh nervously, I'm sure, when I say that, because that's the type of thing that a general manager least wants to hear, or maybe a ministry member. Um, but it really made me think that failure-free activities are meaningless. None of us ever engages in failure-free activities because it doesn't it doesn't help our lives. It doesn't give us a sense of purpose. The only time we have accomplished anything meaningful in our lives is when we did something that we could have failed at and we succeeded. And when you take failure out of activities, then you take meaning and purpose out of activities and people don't want to live. Nobody wants to do a, a crossword puzzle with one letter where you get to put any letter you want and then do it over and over again because you can't be wrong. So to me, uh, when we talk about activities and engagement for people, the question is not really um, how do we create failure-free activities, but how do we create engagement where people can safely fail from time to time so that there actually is some accomplishment and the ability to grow when people can actually develop a skill. Because every skill we've developed, we've made mistakes, whether it's playing the piano, whether it's uh, trying to draw blood, whether it is um, learning a foreign language, we all make mistakes. It's the only way we get better. And when we take that away, then people stop growing. And that is not living. So just another little caution there about that. Now, what about downside risk? 
Well, downside risk is real, okay? And I'm not trying to minimize it or saying you shouldn't consider it. Uh, but we start with those deep, meaningful, continual relationships because when we know people better, we have a better sense of what their ability is and we have a better level of trust in knowing how to negotiate risk. If we use incremental steps, if we use practice, if we use a lot of resources to minimize downside, then we can achieve some early wins. And if you're thinking about doing something with a group of people, like for instance, removing chair alarms in long-term care, rather than just doing it to everybody at once or trying to find the most challenging person, I recommend that people start with the, the easiest one. Find somebody who you think uh, could live without a chair alarm and be kept safe and have their needs met with the least, least amount of effort. Come up with a care plan, meet that person's needs to anticipate, to follow their rhythms, and then try it. And then after a week or two, when you've reached a modicum of success, pick somebody else and try that. And two things happen as you go through this, price, this process. Number one, there's a learning curve. So you begin to learn what people need, why people are getting up, why people uh, are felt to be a fall risk, and you start to come up with better care plans and uh, more proactive approaches. But number two, each time you have to meet somebody's needs, you all have to um, change the way you you operate and relate to each other and go through your day slightly differently in order to accommodate that individual. And uh, as you help each person through this pathway, you make more and more little shifts in the way your team organizes and operates. And by the time you get to that person who you thought could never be safe, you've made so many shifts that all of a sudden it seems achievable. And um, the big thing is never talk about the risk of doing something unless you are also willing to talk about the risk of not doing it because those risks are also real. And I will say, I know there's a lot of fears about what's the ministry gonna say if something bad happens. Um, I cannot speak to individual uh, surveys. We've all got our horror stories about how one individual interpreted the regs and gave somebody a hard time. But I can tell you, I've talked to several people, uh, regulators, uh, both in the US and uh, Canada. And the message I get is that no one expects that someone who is old and frail who moves into a care environment is never going to have anything bad happen to them but if something does happen they would like to come in and open the chart and talk to people and see that there was a logical thought process behind the decision and that's why i talk about documenting and monitoring because that shows that it just wasn't recklessness that, that there actually was a discussion and that that person's values were brought into play and if we truly value person-directed care, person-centered care, if we truly value the rights of residents, then the ministry has to uh, has to accept that that process was followed. And that's that's my philosophy about these these uh, risks with um, surveys. So this is I wrote a, I wrote a four-part uh, blog that's uh, written there uh, on changingaging.org called the hidden restraint, where I talked about locked doors as being a, a restraint. Um, and uh, I just want to read what I put at the end here, this last quote, to talk about negotiating risk. Oops. Um, and that is an injury or death after leaving a building. It is a serious event. Uh, the gravity of that, uh, it shouldn't be minimized. It could be reported all over the news. But for every person who actually suffers that fate, how many people on a daily base, basis are forced to live with anxiety, fear, or life-giving needs that are unmet, or withdraw and give up on life as prisoners of war have done? or become over-medicated with dangerous and sedating drugs as a result of their distress, maybe hundreds and thousands. So those are also newsworthy negative incomes, and they're also going to make the newspapers as consumer awareness grows, and they already are. There's more and more talk now about locked doors being restraints and being affronts to people's human rights. Uh, so you're hearing about it. So once again, um, we've seen the liability environment shift uh, it shifted with physical restraints from I'll sue you if you don't tie my mother up to I'll sue you if you tie my mother up. It shifted with antipsychotics and it's going to shift um, with uh, choice and autonomy as well. And uh, I finished that by saying we must always negotiate risk, balancing it against the ability uh, to live well to the fullest extent uh, possible. And I'll share one last quote, this one for me, that may be the most dangerous situation for a person with dementia is actually the self-fulfilling prophecies that we cause if we underestimate people's abilities or restrict them from living a full life. So I'm gonna stop there. We should have plenty of time, hopefully for some discussion. And um, I would love to hear what people think about this, what questions or comments you might have. Thanks again. All right, thanks very much, Al. So um, as we said, it's now time for question period. So feel free to type out your uh, 
anything you'd like to ask to Al and in the chat box and we'll, or in, sorry, in the questions box and we'll uh, get some answers for you. Yeah, we have almost 150 people on the call or organizations. So <laughs> typing is definitely the way to go here. <laughs> oh, we've got one here. Okay. Presentation. Do you have a framework you use for assessing both positive and negative risk? Um, I'm not sure there's a framework because people are such individuals and, and you know, this is just my bias and, and you may disagree, but I think the more you try to introduce rules, I mean, those seven steps, those guidelines are the best I could get because I think that when you start to create more rules or algorithms, then you stop individualizing. So I would rather just use the values of of negotiating risk, of trying to optimize safe choices, and uh, just know the person really well, and know that what you do for Frank is not what you're going to do for Bill or for Mary or for Joan. Um, they're all going to be a little bit different. Um, but if you're guided by a strong internal set of values, then that's the best way to be fair. Fair is not equal, but fair is 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 more just than than just treating everybody the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, next question here. Um, do you have any tips for speaking to families who fear their loved ones leaving or eloping? <laughs> um, I think number one, to, to once again, to keep them updated, to engage them in the discussion, to hear what their concerns are, uh, to, uh, to tell them that, you're, that really your, uh, your main job, job one, is to support the well-being and the rights of their loved one. And if they have suggestions into how you could do that as safely as possible, like some of the people on this call came up with great suggestions for Frank, uh, you'd love to hear them. But you have to kind of draw the line to say that ultimately your job is to, is to support that resident, not not that resident's son or daughter or husband or wife, and um, and that um, you know uh, to 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 do it gently and to bring in their input and to listen to their concerns, but to understand you know where your where your duty lies. Um, and to keep that firmly in mind and make sure that your values are behind it and make sure that you have had discussions and, and bring that loved one in there. Don't do not do this separately. Make sure that they can hear their loved ones saying, I don't care if I have a chance of falling. I'm going crazy in here and I need to go outside. If they can hear their loved ones say that, they're going to feel a lot better than if it's just done in a separate room without that person being engaged. All right. Goodness, so many questions are coming in. <laughs> I figured it's, it's one of those provocative talks. I'm not surprised. Yes, it definitely is. Um, someone's asking, can you describe interactions with families to help them to engage in the discussion? We often find that families are the ones pushing for limitations. You know, not, yeah, they are. And that's often the case. I would, you know, that Atul Gawande quote, and you'll get it on your handout. I think it's a wonderful quote because it makes us all look at ourselves. And I, I have to admit, I've done it myself with family members, you know, um, where I've said, oh, I don't know if she should be going down the basement doing her own laundry. Those steps, you know, are steep and they go right to a concrete floor. And, and, and then thinking, well, who am I to say, you know? That's why we have handrails. That's why you know she's been doing it for for 70 years. Well, how am I, who am I to say that, that that can't be done? So I think we all have to look at ourselves and say, what would I do? And is there some magical time in my life when I'm going to let other people run my life and uh, and um, tell me what to do? Um, and and I think we have to gently give people that insight that we're not going to call your daughter out in in you know New Mexico and uh, ask her whether whether your meal is, is a is a healthy meal for you to eat, you know, so why are we asking you what your father should do, you know, similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, someone else is asking what methods of tra tracking outcomes can be used to report on overall well being, um, for example, to replace reduction in falls, um, reduction in X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, there are ways to measure those well-being domains. There's a tool for looking at that, so you can see if uh, that. A, a lot of it is just to also look at the person. And, and once again, it's it's hard to come up with quality with quantitative scales, but you can tell. We certainly could tell with Frank uh, when he stopped yelling and screaming and banging on the doors. Uh, that was pretty obvious. If people engage more, if people are getting out more, if they seem to be getting up and moving more, you can see it. You may not be able to put a number to it. But if the care plan shows that, if you show that people are maintaining their functional ability, that their mood is good, they're not they're not hitting any of the depression or the agitation scales that people measure uh, because they're they're more engaged and happier, then you've kind of proven your case. If you're not giving people uh, psychotropic drugs or taking them off it once you put these things in place, 
then once again, you've showed an improvement too. So, so I think those are the kinds of things that, you know, as Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted, not everything that can be counted counts. <laughs> so I think we have to broaden our ideas as to how we measure this. And once again, documentation is really helpful because if you can describe what you see, that can be very powerful. And circling back to um, discussions with families, um, someone's asking, given that more and more families are substitute decision makers, um, meaning that we have to abide by their wishes, what is your approach to attempting to align the wishes of the resident with potentially opposing views of the substitute decision makers? Um, I just want to remind people that substitute decision makers um, have, a, have a narrower role than a lot of people think. Um, you know, there are when there are things that you truly cannot decide, like how to transfer property or how to sign an advanced directive or give consent for surgery, then the substitute decision maker steps in. So two places where we kind of miss the boat. Number one, often when somebody just moves into a, some sort of a senior living environment, the, the substitute decision maker steps in and says, okay, I'm in charge, uh, when, when they actually they have not lost the capacity. But secondly, even when they do lose the capacity for some big decisions, it's very common for us to just take everything away. But a person who can't uh, make those big decisions, who may not even know all their children's names, can still tell you if they want to shower, if they want or don't want something to eat, and they can explain why they want to do something. And uh, remember that the job of the substitute decision maker is to support the expressed wishes of the person to the farthest amount possible, not to decide something against the person's wishes, but to actually support what they know that person would want in any given situation. Um, so I think people misunderstand what that whole SDM role is. And uh, sometimes we have to remind people uh, what, the, what the limitations are. Um, another question, um, someone's wondering if the, uh, what kind of conversations can make structural changes, um, for example, in a small size home that will allow for more autonomy? Um, a lot of things. Well, first of all, small size home is a great place to start <laughs> because one of, the, one of the biggest barriers to autonomy in people who are old or frail is, um, is size. So if you have to walk 100 meters to get to the dining room, you might end up in a wheelchair. Whereas if it's you know just 20 meters away from your room, you might be independent getting to meals. Um, so uh, so the scale of an environment can have a big effect on people's autonomy. Um, many other environmental features. If the lighting is good, if there are not a lot of loud, chaotic, distracting sounds, make it hard to focus on conversation. That can in, empower people. If there are good wayfinding cues, if the design, the flooring, the the, uh, the cues around doors and identifiers are optimized, those can all improve autonomy. A lot of people are doing things we don't like because they get lost, because we have confusing layouts or because we don't understand their needs. Um, and, so, and so we blame them or we blame their dementia when actually we just haven't created an environment that really optimizes their ability to be in charge and to do for themselves. So you can definitely uh, walk through a living area with an eye at the design and the layout and the wayfinding cues and all those things and say, are these helping people with dementia or are they disabling them? And um, to that end, I'm working on a guide that helps team members actually do that in their environment. And I hope that's something that we can uh, get out and make available to people. We're going to do a little bit of uh, in-house testing in Schlegel Villages over the next couple of months, and it is my desire. Um, I, I created this with a practicum student, uh, formerly from the University of Guelph, named Laura Aguiar, who really uh, gave some great input into this. And and um, so we're, we hope to come out with this little environmental audit tool that is not for architects, it's for team members, so they can walk through an environment, maybe even with some of the residents, and say, what works about this room, what doesn't? what works about this hallway, what doesn't. And um, some things will be things can, that can easily be changed, uh, like lighting or clutter or things like that, or a different sign. Some things like this hallway is, uh, you know, twice as long as it needs to be, might not be easily be changed because you can't necessarily tear down the walls. So um, the question is, uh, you know, how, you, how user friendly is the tool and uh, will it lead to things that can be done to improve the environment? And so we're gonna, we're gonna play around with that a little bit and um, hopefully, that will be out there, but there are some good design guides out there for people living with dementia. One of them is um, is the Dementia Enabling and Empowering Empowerment Project, um, DEEP, -E -E which has guidelines. Uh, Dr. Richard Fleming and Kirsty Bennett from the University of Wollongong 
in Australia have design guidelines that I think are shared with Dementia Australia. Uh, the University of Stirling in Scotland has some really good guideline, guidelines for living environments uh, for people with dementia. So those are some of the places where you can also find more information about those things. I'm assuming as I go through this that the question was about the physical environment. Just make sure that I answered the question correctly. Um, that's how uh, I. Yeah, I think so. The wording they used was structural changes. Okay, um, good. Interpreted a couple of ways, but um, so far no one has asked to clarify. So. <laughs> and and you know that applies to the home too. I mean, there, your experience of home, your experience of the layout of your home may change as your perceptions change with dementia. So just because you're living in the place you've lived in for the past 40 years doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect for you as you live with dementia. So even someone's own house needs to have an audit once in a while to find out if, um, you know, the lighting and the, the, the wayfinding and things that worked for me when I didn't have dementia are still working for me or if adjustments need to be made there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, one last question here. Um, so this person's wondering if there's any research or studies um, that point to the declining rate of dementia and um, things that can help people live a healthy life. Um, there are some studies out there. I can't quote them off the top of my head. I read a lot of things as they come by and I don't necessarily uh, have the citations uh, listed anywhere. But a couple of studies, large scale uh, studies over time that have come out in the last you know, they may have started 15 or 20 years ago, but they were reported within the last five years, suggests that as you move through each decade of life from the 80 year olds to the 70 year olds to the 60 year olds down to the 40 year olds and 30 year olds, that each succeeding younger group has a lower lifetime risk of dementia than the older group. Um, so that's good news because we're all hearing all this panic about dementia, but the truth is that our lifetime risk of dementia is decreasing as we get younger. And um, that is probably because of better preventive health, better, better diet, better um, cardiovascular, blood pressure, blood sugar control, all those you know, educational things that help us live healthier lives. Because so many of those things, blood pressure, strokes, heart disease, are, compete, are, are contributing factors to different types of dementia. Um, I'm gonna give that a little caution though, because there's also evidence that the youngest generation is a lot less mobile. They're sitting in front of computers all the time. Cholesterol and weights are going up. And um, there's concern that actually life expectancy may start down again you know, over the younger generations because of those poor health factors. So I'm not saying this is going to go on forever, but it is true that the rate of dementia is declining. Just to make an editorial comment, so why are we concerned about these increasing rates of dementia? Well, the reason the total number of people with dementia is getting older is simply mathematics. It's because the people that are getting older now are my generation, which is the baby boomers. There's 10,000 Americans turning 65 every single day and will be for the next several years, and probably a similar proportion in Canada over 65 uh, in most of the industrialized world because of the baby boom. So because dementia remains primarily an age-related disorder, when you have a lot more people getting old, you're gonna have a lot more cases of dementia. And that's the main reason in the industrialized world why the rates are going up so significantly. In other areas of the world, low and middle income countries, it's probably more due to better control of infectious diseases, uh, better settlement of warfare and things like that, um, control of things like, like HIV that have devastated some countries. So they'll have a little bit of a lag time, but as their generations start to live longer, they're going to see even a greater population increase with dementia. Uh, so a different factor there. But it's purely math. If you just look at Canada and the US, you know, uh, even though we're going to have a, maybe three times as many people with dementia in 2050, just remember that in 2070, when the baby boomers are all gone, that number is going to go down, even if there's no new treatments, because it was just this big bubble that went through the aging process. So, um, so yeah, the, there are some studies out there. I can't quote them, but if you if you do a little search, you should be able to find a couple about the decreasing lifetime uh, incidence rates of dementia that we've been noticing, at least in the industrialized world. All right, thanks, Al. Well, that brings us uh, pretty much to one o'clock, so I'm mindful of everyone's time and we'll wrap up now. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and also to Al for sharing your wisdom with us over these past few webinars that you've done with the Ontario CLRI. Um, we're so appreciative of your time and your strategies to help us create a change in our long-term care communities. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar and it will be archived on the Ontario CLRI website. 
and um, there will be a, an email that will be sent out to notify everyone. So you can watch that with your teams or um, you know, at a slower pace and on your own time. And um, don't hesitate to reach out to myself. Um, if you have questions for Al, I can always uh, direct them to him and we'll, we'll get back to you when possible. And um, again, there is a survey at the end of the webinar. So as soon as you close your window, you should see one pop up and you can give us your feedback on the experience today and also let us know what you'd like to learn in future webinars. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And thank you to, to you as well, Al. Yeah, and thank you everybody. And thanks to uh, Holly and Tammy and Kate for setting this up. Thanks everybody for being part of this. <laughs> All right, have a good afternoon, everyone. We're going to sign off. Take care now.